This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Our voices have ascended into space, announcing our presence to the universe. Other men on other worlds may be listening. We await an answer from afar, placed by an intelligence we do not know, we will not recognize, we may not even understand. Radio waves that might bear the conversations of distant beings are monitored, day and night, by astronomers throughout the world. Our understanding of life in outer space may begin with reaching out to another form of intelligence here on Earth. If we can communicate with one strange intelligence, we can hope to communicate with others. We have always dreamed of talking with celestial beings. Discoveries in deep space have revealed that the same chemistry that created earthly life operates elsewhere. Perhaps we are not accidents of creation. Perhaps we are not alone. Giant ultra-sensitive instruments tune in on the frequencies of other worlds as we begin a cosmic journey. The search for intelligent life beyond the planet Earth has begun, and the job is as immense as the universe itself. Our galaxy alone contains an estimated 250 billion stars, and there are at least 100 billion other galaxies. How many of these stars have Earth-like planets harboring life? Until recently, we searched with our eyes, aided by telescopes. Then, with the advent of radio, a whole new noisy universe emerged, and man began to listen to the stars. In 1971, at NASA's Ames Research Center, 24 scientists and engineers began the search for other life. Led by Dr. Bernard Oliver and Dr. John Billingham, the group concluded that radio is the most effective way of detecting other voices in space. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence, nicknamed SETI, became a reality. Dr. Oliver explains. The the concept of doing this really has its origin in the belief that we will have to go to other stars rather than just other planets of our own system before we find intelligent life. And the belief that that is an extremely difficult thing to do physically. If we are not going to cross the gulf of interstellar space, how then are we going to ever detect other intelligent life? The answer seems to be by looking for evidence of it in the form of signals that it may either radiate on purpose to arouse our attention or simply in the course of its own activities. It's quite possible that signals have been falling on the Earth for uh, millions or billions of years. In 1931, extraterrestrial radio signals were accidentally discovered by Bell telephone engineer Carl Jansky. Jansky detected a hiss that seemed to be coming from the very center of our galaxy. For the first time, dense star clouds, invisible to optical telescopes, revealed their presence through radio emissions. Grote Reber, an enthusiastic radio amateur, confirmed Jansky's observations. Using a homemade backyard antenna, Reber found that radio emissions of natural origin occur throughout our galaxy. Then in 1961, the search for intentional signals began. At Greenbank, West Virginia, a radio telescope was used for the first time to listen for intelligent signals from space. Project Ozma, a whimsical reference to the land lying over the rainbow, was followed ten years later by the most far-reaching life search program ever devised. The Cyclops plan was to start with a modest-sized antenna element, say something like 300 feet in diameter, 
and simply add additional ones as time went on to increase the total collecting area. This sort of a system is known as an antenna array, and it works by having all of the antennas feed their signals together into a common receiver, a common detector, uh, so that they add in phase and act as if they had been picked up by a single antenna. So we believe we can take as many as a thousand antennas and connect them together in this fashion and get a huge collecting area. A listening post beyond Earth is an alternative explored by SETI astronomer, Dr. Charles Seeger. A basic problem in a search for extraterrestrial signals has to do with the interference to receiving systems produced by all our transmissions in the same radio frequency spectrum. Space uh, may offer some advantages and may not be all that more expensive for a large receiving system than on Earth. Space has the advantage of uh, a more benign environment. Uh, you don't have winds and storms and rain and repainting to do all the time. It's very quiet. Also, you can put up a very light system in space. It floats there. The backside of the moon is attractive since there you are beautifully shielded from all Earth activity. What we envision is to reproduce in the craters of the moon a series of Arecibo type antennas and it's estimated by engineers that one could build a thousand or three thousand foot or even larger perhaps Arecibo type structures relatively economically scattering them among a bunch of adjacent craters uh, on the back of the moon. An alternative to the uh, moon is to have an antenna floating in space in orbit around the earth. The early antennas would be so arranged that they could be constructed in space, carried out in pieces on a shuttle, along with the work as necessary to construct it. It would then be set into orbit and the shuttle would return while we tried out the device. While we wait for a call from space, we have not ruled out breaking the silence of the universe by sending our own signals to cosmic neighbors. Nestled in the tropical mountain jungle of Puerto Rico is the largest radio telescope on Earth. A thousand feet across and 300 feet deep, the Arecibo telescope can listen to signals from the farthest reaches of the universe. It can also converse with other beings in the cosmos. On November 16, 1974, Man prepared to beam his first and only intentional signal to intelligence beyond the Earth. take 24,000 years to reach star cluster M13 in the constellation Hercules. In code, the message describes our solar system, the Earth, and the life upon it. The chemical basis of life on Earth is represented by the famous double helix of DNA. The final depiction of a human being is like a cry in the night of space. Who or what? will answer our call. On March 2nd, 1972, Pioneer 10 began its 21-month journey to Jupiter. Attached to the spacecraft is a plaque kind of planetary Rosetta Stone, designed by astronomer Dr. Carl Sagan. But in the remote contingency that there are interstellar spacefaring societies, which might someday pick up this derelict no longer radioing, we thought we would put a message on it to indicate a little bit of where we are, when we are, and who we are. 
we think that the, the information on where we are and when we are, indicated in this part of the message by the configuration of certain cosmic objects called pulsars, will be completely obvious to uh, any society capable of traveling between the stars. These two objects will be more mysterious because it is unlikely that there will be human beings anywhere else, even though there may be other creatures elsewhere. And the plaque has served a very useful purpose in making us think about what sort of impression we might wish to give to the cosmos. Pioneer 10 flew past Jupiter in December 1973. In 1984, it will leave the solar system forever. Who will pick up our message floating in interstellar space? Radio waves traveling much faster than Pioneer will provide our first clue. Any signal that we pick up will certainly not have originated from a civilization much less advanced technically than we, because it is only very recently that we have been able to radiate and detect such signals. If we look at the enormous time spans involved, then it seems very likely that what we will find is a civilization considerably more advanced than ourselves, and which might have reasons for attempting to contact us that we do not even comprehend at the present time. At Ames Research Center, psychologist Dr. Mary Connors is working to determine what an extraterrestrial civilization might be like. Basically, uh, on the non-technological issues, which is what I'm primarily concerned with, we're concerned with, with two basic questions. One is what, is, what can we know about the nature of the intelligence that we're likely to contact? Well, what do we know about intelligence? We could ask, what is intelligence? What possible forms can it take? What can we learn from animal intelligence? The dolphin, although it shares our planet, exists in a world of its own. It speaks a language we do not comprehend. Its brain size is comparable to man's. Yet the dolphin is still an enigma, as alien to us as a creature from outer space. At San Diego SeaWorld, trainers and scientists work behind the scenes in an intensive effort to unravel the mysteries of dolphin sonar and communication. I'll tell you what, we'll give you another munchie for that. The dolphin has always seemed akin to man, and some have wondered if this creature, even now, is attempting to communicate with us. Uh, but he doesn't know yet what the difference means. The greatest problem remains the limit of our own experience. There you go. Despite our theories and our hopes, okay. man has yet to exchange one word with the dolphin. SeaWorld's curator of mammals, Dr. Lanny Cornell, and researcher Sherry Gish are interested in cracking the communication barrier. One of the projects that we have in an overall study of communications amongst dolphins is one between two animals in two pools uh, separated by a soundproof gate which allows us to determine specifically when the animals will be able to communicate with one another. Cornell and his assistant will monitor every sound emitted by the two dolphins. The exchange, each signal and response, will be carefully studied and patterns of sound production analyzed. Sound waves are converted into a form that can be measured electronically. An oscilloscope reveals the changes in frequencies, some inaudible to the human ear. At 1 16th normal speed, the intricacies of dolphin signals become apparent. dolphin is one form of non-human intelligence. The form that extraterrestrial life may take is subject to scientific speculation. It does appear that at least at our present stage of evolution there may be some advantages to being structured uh, at least with some of the characteristics that we have. There are clear advantages for example to having two eyes uh, with which you can uh, see in color and with which you can achieve binocular vision. It's clear that there are advantages to having an upright posture, 
clear that there are advantages to having a, a brain located at one end of the body, and you can go on like this. If it is inevitable that another civilization will have had at one point some of the characteristics we have now, will contact with these alien beings from some unknown planet bring doomsday to our tiny world? Or do the benefits to our future outweigh the dangers? The greatest miracle that we have before us is the fact that within a few billion years, the universe, through the marvelous laws of chemistry and physics, has converted part of itself into consciousness, and that part can now contemplate the universe that begat it. A French scientist put it this way, astronomy is useful because it shows us how small is man's body, how great his mind. Dr. John Krauss is an electrical engineer and astronomer at Ohio State University. He is one of a few who are working intently to solve the riddle of the universe. To answer the question, are we alone? He is philosophical about his mission. I think one of the exciting things about all this work is that uh, those of us who are involved are, are like pioneers. We are exploring the, the universe. It's a pioneering venture to uh, find out what is out there and perhaps who is out there. Searching for extraterrestrial intelligence is um, like looking for um, a needle in a haystack. Assuming that we're not unique and that there are intelligent beings elsewhere, we have to try and second guess them. But uh, you, you need some kind of um, road map. Dr. Krauss's road map is a giant radio telescope that he helped design and build. He affectionately calls it Big Ear. Larger than three football fields in area, Big Ear has detected signals from the most distant known objects in the universe. Could Big Ear now find intelligent signals in the vastness of space? Hi, Dr. Krauss. Anything Hello. interesting? Well, yeah, we have some unusual... We began our search on Friday, the 7th of December, 1973. Bob Dixon and Ed Tega worked for weeks, setting up and testing an eight-channel filter and getting it ready for the life search. Well, why not run it? Let's give it a go. All right. There was no fuss or fanfare. Switches were set, recorders started, and the data began to flow. Now our big ear was listening for other men on other planets, circling other stars, who might have built beacon stations to announce their presence. If Bob Dixon said, we got something that looks interesting, John, I, I'm sure it wouldn't be that he had recorded a voice saying, uh, this is planet MX3 calling Earth. It wouldn't be anything as direct and unequivocal as that. It would just be a little bump on a squiggly line record that uh, went on for hundreds of feet that uh, occurred in a way that set it off from others. We may have to wait a long time. The probability of life developing elsewhere is hard to determine definitely, but I don't think it is zero. And if it is not zero, then I think we have a chance. Someday this uh, call from space may come. It's hard to say when it will. The signal that we're looking for might uh, be found uh, within a day, but it might take, uh, might be weeks, years, but it will have profound significance to man. If we are not alone, what will we say to our neighbors? For centuries, man thought that the Earth was the center of the universe. The sun, moon, and stars were to light our days and nights. Then Galileo turned his telescope to the sky, and we learned that the moon and planets were worlds beyond dispute. 
that the stars weren't just ornaments in the sky, but represented a cosmos far beyond man's earthly imagination. We dreamt of life beyond the planet Earth and set out to explore the universe. We began, humbly, with the moon. I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry We found that there is no man in the moon, but there are nine other planets in our solar system. So we set our sights on Mars and sent our probe. Now we look beyond to the vastness of the universe and search the stars for voices of other beings. If we were in fact to decipher messages from the other civilizations over and above simply receiving a signal and knowing that they are there, then it is conceivable we might learn about the pathways that they took when they were at our present stage of development. I think in this way uh, one can easily visualize a network of intercommunicating societies growing up in our galaxy. Such a network could achieve results in science and in philosophy and in other fields uh, that would be more painful if they were isolated. Past human history may be only the prelude to our future as members of a galactic society. Our future will begin with a call from space. Coming up next, a high-tension investigation starts up when a federal judge is gunned down in front of his home on FBI The Untold Stories. Then history's crimes and trials probes controversial and conflicting theories about the JFK assassination. 